Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another edition of the Mill Georgia Spotlight. I'm your host, Jack Ellis. Thank you so much for joining us again here this week on WMUB Channel 38. Our program is sponsored by Caduceus Medicine and J. Franklin Automotive. And we hasten to say, add that the uh, views expressed here on WMUB on the Mill Georgia Spotlight are those of myself and the guests, not necessarily those of Mercy University or WMUB. Now that we got that out of the way, let me ask you to help me welcome in the spotlight this week, Mike Austin, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Macon Bibb County Housing Authority. I guess it's just the Macon Housing Authority. I don't know whether that's still Macon. But anyway, Mike, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Mayor. Good Thanks to see you. Mike, there's so many things I want to talk to you about when it comes to housing when it, yeah. and, and, and Macon. We, 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 we know that there's a shortage of affordable housing. I want to talk to you about a lot of things that's going on, a lot of great things that the Housing Authority is doing. Right. But we also want to talk about the, some of the obstacles sure. that the you have, the challenges right. it is right. to house people in the Macon, Georgia, right. especially right. people who are at the lower right. end of the income right. scale. Right. Right. Yes, and thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a little while since we've been able to do it this. Has, and some things, you. some exciting things have happened um, since you and I last spoke on this uh, great program. But you're right. There, there are major challenges in the United States as well as making bid as far as housing. In, in our case, affordable housing. Affordable housing. Affordable yeah. housing. So in our case, in Macon, we're roughly at a 27.5% uh, poverty rate, which, which is high. Well, a lot of folks in that category, obviously, the first thing they need is, is housing. And at the Housing Authority, our mission, of course, is to house as many people as we can with good, affordable housing. And frankly, there's a shortage. So the, the national stat, and it's pretty much true here in Macon as well, the national stat is that for every uh, three houses or three people who, for every 10 people who need housing, there's only three houses available. So that's a huge gap. So, so basically, that's why you see nationwide and in Macon Bid, housing authority lists uh, that are long. And so if I want such a, list, a, a waiting me. list, yeah, a waiting list even for public housing or other affordable housing. So there's basically three types of affordable housing. There's the, what we call conventional Section 8. That's a voucher. You take that voucher and you go really anywhere in the United States. And you strike a deal with a landlord and then the housing authority helps pay your rent. So that's Section 8. And then there's conventional public housing where I live in the unit, the housing authority owns it and manages it, and they help pay the rent. And then the third part, the third uh, type is tax credits. And you've heard, you and I have talked a lot about tax credits, and that's basically where private investors will come into an area and team up with a housing authority or a developer to build affordable housing or to rehab existing affordable housing. So those are the three types. Well. In every case, in Macon Bib and throughout the United States, there's a waiting list for all types of affordable housing simply because there's a shortage and, 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 and the demand is, is just unbelievable. And that makes, a, makes it a big challenge for housing authorities across the United States. We, we call ourselves housers and we like to house people, um, but that's challenging. And one, one of the things uh, that I always say to people is affordable housing is affordable for people who live there but it's not affordable to build, and it's not affordable to, main, to maintain. And so people who are in the ha affordable housing business, like housing authorities or sometimes private developers, they have to be very, very disciplined because the revenue that they get from the housing, from the rent, is capped. You know, we can't just charge $1,200 a month for rent. So, but we, we still have the same costs that a private owner would have. So when the plumber shows up, I always give this example, when the plumber shows up to Section 8 or to public housing to, or to a tax credit, I can't get a 30% discount. I've got to pay the plumber what the plumber wants. And, and so housers, as we call ourselves, affordable housers, we have to be very, very disciplined and very careful that, that we're uh, building properties that we can maintain long term. And so that's our mission. We're very passionate about it. We have a lot of good housing in Macon Bibb, and uh, frankly, across the United States, we do. 
Now, you spoke about the three, the, the, the Section 8, the tax credit, and, of course, the housing. But what about the site-based Section 8? Right. Let's say Bonville, yes, Christian yes, Tower, yes. The, the Dempsey, Dempsey downtown. Right. There's lots now, of those. Those are HUD, funded by yeah. HUD, but not necessarily through your office. Correct. That's a very good point. So in the United States right now, there's about 18,000 of those type properties. In Macon Bib, there's probably 20-ish of those types of properties. And they are exactly what you say. They're called project-based Section 8. And what that means is some private owner out there owns that property, and then he or she has a 20-year contract with HUD directly. And basically the contract says, we will, HUD will send that property subsidy to help make the rents affordable for the people who live there. And in return, the owner agrees to keep the property up to basic standards. And there's more nuances than that, but that's basically it. And so, it, like you mentioned, in Macon, there's roughly 20 of those types of properties. The Dempsey is one. Um, Bible Christian is another. And there's, there's 18 or so others in Macon. And oftentimes, as you can imagine, because we're the housing authority, if there's a problem, sometimes people say, well, gosh, it's HUD, so that must be, mean the housing authority. And so they'll call us. And so if it is one of the properties that we're not associated with, we know who to go to at HUD. And, and so it's not uncommon for us to call HUD and say, hey, we don't manage this or own it, but we understand there's an issue there. Can you guys at HUD look into it? And they're usually pretty good about doing that. Um, it, we know in some instances there's other properties that aren't project-based, but, but, but maybe they've got some voucher holders in them. A good example of a recent challenge is, is the property that we, that we all, as a community, had to kind of rally around, and that was out uh, oh, Crystal, Lake. Crystal Lake Apartments. That was a, you know, the whole community came together here six Well, those six to eight, some people there, Five didn't. of them, yeah. Five, 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 five of the 250-some-odd units were vouchers. The strange and challenging thing about Crystal Lake is that there were basically three, si three parts of that property, a high-rise, a mid-rise, and then kind of scattered sites. And the, the main problem, as we understood it, was in that high-rise. We had reports that the elevator wasn't working, the water had been turned off a couple times. For whatever reason, the owner of the property wasn't paying the water bill. And so because we, the housing authority, has such good relationships with the fire department and the water authority, we, we all kind of worked together. We found out that only five people who had a voucher lived there. They lived in pretty good stuff. They didn't live in the high-rise. But we got so upset about the situation, we took the five people who lived there with a the voucher and said, look, here's a brand new voucher. Come to the housing authority. We want you out of there because this owner, for whatever reason, is not working with the water authority. He or she's not working with the, with the fire department. And so we moved those five out. Well, that, that was great for those five, but the people who lived there who didn't have Section 8, there was really no way to help them, but the community came together through a lot of county commissioners and yeah. um, wonderful people around the community, the Red Cross, and the list goes on, all came together, and most of those people were helped. But that was reactive. That was reactive. That was reactive. 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 Exactly. Now, who's responsible to make sure that people are not living in those conditions in the first place? You know, that's because that, yeah. at Bonneville Christian Tower, the senior citizen called me over there, sure, and I, I saw mold, yeah. I saw mildew. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw a whole lot of other things yeah. that we wouldn't want. I sure. wouldn't want my sure. loved ones living And there. we wouldn't want to live there, yeah. too. So the, the, when, it's, when it's HUD related, it, it, it's the housing authority. Who's the one who's inspecting that to make right. do they let them? Are we, do we have the fox watching the hen house, if you will? Right. Do they right. do their own self they, they do. When it's a HUD property, like a, like a Dempsey, and there's a contract there, what they'll do is they'll send out a, a, an inspection team, independent, HUD will, and okay. they'll say, you know, and if you get a good score, then they might not come back for three years. Well, the problem with that, a lot of things can happen in three years. A lot of things. You, you know that. If, you know, any, any, I don't care who you rent to. If you don't check on your property for three years, you're, you might be in for a surprise when you, when you go in three years. So HUD's system, in my view, is a little bit flawed. And, and, in, and indeed, they are working on that nationwide. Yeah. To but address that. Say, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. But can't the health department, if we know there's a health sure, issue with sure. mold, mildew, sure. I'm sure we have some a local controls and buttons that we can push yes. locally to make sure that people are living in uh, safe houses. Sure. So the main buttons, if, if Section 8's not involved, the main buttons that we can push as a community, one would be fire department, and they're really good at, at inspecting uh, for fire safety and code things, and then code enforcement at the county. 
they, they go out, and, and if it's not Section 8, and there's a lot of private, I mean, there's a ton of them, they're going to look for major code violations. The other one that you mentioned is the health department. So if there's issues of, of vermin or moisture issues, then they're a good uh, agency to call to go out and look. The other one that we use sometimes is DFACS. So maybe we're aware of a, maybe there's a situation where a child, there's children involved, and there might be moisture issues or there might be vermin issues or infestation. We'll call DFACS, and a lot of times they're really good. So between those four agencies, um, you know, people can call those types of agencies, and, and they'll react. I've seen them react okay. um, to things like that. But proactive, but being proactive, we don't have a go-to person. It's not your that's responsibility. Right, that's right. Up. Sure. And, and that's a challenge. Yeah. And, and we, in my view, yeah. you know, there's some, there's some cities around the nation who will have more of a proactive approach. And, and in my view, we need to have that here in Macon Bibb. Because here's, here's the really interesting uh, uh, piece of data. In Macon Bibb, there's roughly 155,000 people who live here, population. Roughly half of those people rent. And so, and that's kind of true nationwide. And out of those half, that's running 27% of the total or in poverty. In poverty, yeah. would qualify you the public housing right. or Section sure, 8. Sure, sure. 27% yeah, of the population. That's huge. That's, that's huge. huge. So, and so only 5 or 6% of those 60,000 renters are on Section 8. So that means the rest of them, they've got to live where there's no oversight. So in general Section 8, if it's a Section 8 voucher, we inspect, the housing authority must inspect at least once a year. And, of course, a lot can happen in once a year, and the housing authority is not perfect, and, and, and from time to time we have issues that we have to get on and correct. But at least if you're on Section 8 and you have a voucher, you know that property is going to be inspected at least once a year. But if you're not lucky enough to have Section 8 and, you li and you're, not, you're not well off, you're in that poverty demographic. So you, you're at the mercy of a slumlord. Could you're at the mercy. Absolutely. And yeah. we see a lot of that. And, 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 and I think that's where we, we as a community need to think of ways, like you mentioned, to be proactive in those types of situations uh, okay. so that we don't find this as much. Speaking of being proactive, now you talked about Section 8. The list is long. The list is long. And not only is the list long, but you cut it off, I understand. Absolutely. Yeah. You cut it off, yeah. but yet there are so many. We don't know how many people will. So we know 27%. Right. Right. How many do we have? A, how many people on the list, right? So, in any given, any day, given really? time, there's probably 3,000 on the list. On the waiting list. On a waiting list, yeah. Just and we don't know how they're living in the meantime. Right. Those, we know they qualify. Right. We don't know what their living conditions are. Correct. We know that they need subsidized yeah. housing. Yeah. And so. And, and we know that how many. You cut it off, so it could be another five or six thousand. Absolutely, waiting to be on. Who that couldn't get on? Yeah. And so what we do generally, and a lot of housing authorities do this, is we open up the Section Eight waiting list, oftentimes just for a week. And in a week, it's, we'll take three thousand applications. We then we close it because it takes us a couple of years to work through those three thousand families. Then once we work through all those, we'll open it again. Well, the good news in making bid is we're about ready to open it. So probably in 2020, early, we'll open it again. And the floodgates will open. We'll take a whole bunch of applications. Applications will shut it again, and here we go. But not only is the list long in for Section 8 vouchers, it's long at almost every affordable property we have. So, for instance, last time you and I spoke, we were just finishing up Tyndall Seniors Towers. Great, great, great job, by the way. Thank you. Wonderful yeah. property. I think we opened that, and within two months, we had it full. And it's 76 units. Now, is this senior citizen? Senior citizen, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, 62, 62 plus. Yep, yeah, right. And after how many, go, go back again, you, after opening, how long you had? Two months, we filled it up, and now, today, roughly, we've got, so it's full, 76 units full, and we've got almost 100 people just on that waiting list, just at that site, waiting for that particular site. And, and, and that story's replicated. That's just, that's right, that you could hunt school, you could probably have the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Uh, hunt school. Uh, what's the other one uh, out there on Pearl the Stevens, Stevens, Pearl Stevens, the same story. Same thing, and, 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 and because the need is so great. And. And it's frustrating and because, we, you know, of course, the mission of the Housing Authority is to, to find it, to build it, to, to rehab it, and, and to provide more of it. Here's the, here's the real challenge with affordable housing. Because of the residue caps that we talked about, so if you and I opened up an apartment building, we could, you and I could charge whatever we wanted, right? As long as the market would pay it, if, if the market said, you, can, you guys can charge $1,500 a, a unit, we could do that. 
when I'm in affordable housing, is capped by regulation. So the regulation may say, oh, you can only maximum charge $700. Well, I've still got to build it. And with construction prices the way they are, it makes it very, very difficult to pay a mortgage with your capped revenue. And so what I always tell people is that the secret of affordable housing is cheap money. So you and I were talking the other day about um, uh, Apple Apple computers who just unveiled a $2.5 billion plan in California to help mm -hmm. augment their housing, affordable housing, their affordable housing challenges. That's wonderful, but we need more of that. So in my opinion, Congress needs to let go of a lot more money when it comes to affordable housing. And then private businesses need to step up around the nation like Apple to help augment the, the challenge of affordable housing because it takes cheap money. In other words, I can't, I can't make a mortgage payment based on regular conventional rates. I've got to make a mortgage payment re on reduced revenue, so I've got to have cheap money. So in Apple's case, they're providing grants and even free loans to certain sectors of that affordable housing market out there to make it so that those deals are doable. And we need more of that in the United States and in Macon, too. So that's, that's kind of yeah. a challenge. Well, Mike, what we do know, there are a lot of apartments being built, we call them lofts, whatever you want to call them, right. they're being built right. all over the place. Right, right, right. Uh, near the new mall, downtown, sure. Ron Mercer. Sure. Sure. How many of those units, I'm, if you're aware of this, Mike, right, right. set aside affordable houses or accept a section right, of right. in those units? Very few, if, it, very few, if any. So here, here's another challenge. So we why all that? why that? Well, the, I what think they're getting the money anyway. If right. we're going to give them a voucher right. for six, sure. uh, twelve hundred dollars, whatever sure. it is, why aren't they accepting right. people with right. those vouchers? That's a good question. In my view, in some instances, it's nimbyism, right. not my backyard. Yeah. So, so you know, everybody thinks affordable housing is great, but but just some people say five or six inside of the building, sure. for instance. Right, a good mix. Yeah, I want to get on my soapbox. Please, here. please, please. Dannenberg was funded by a Department of Community Affairs grant, right, right one point right. two five million right, dollars right, to do right, it, right. to build lofts there. Right. Now you would think that we would said if we're going to use federal dollars to build this thing, that we're going to set aside, set aside at least three right, or four right. units in here sure. for workforce housing, sure. if not affordable. Right. Housing. Right. And that's good policy. In fact, I've seen some cities and counties around the nation who, who will say to developers, look, we're going to help, whether it's a tax, maybe it's a penny tax, or maybe it's a, it's a federal grant, we're going to help put this capital stack together for you, Mr. Developer. However, as part of that deal, you have to, you have to allocate or reserve a certain percentage of those units for affordable housing, which is good practice because it brings in a good mix and it helps get the deal done. We all, we all like the lofts. I think, the, the, and, and you and I have talked about this many times, downtown is wonderful. It's a good thing. But in my view, of we've course, we've got to have, some affordable, have some affordable housing. Really, the only affordable housing we have now in, in downtown is the Dempsey, and it's been there forever, and it's a great place, but we need more of it. And, and more to the point, workforce. That's a real, workforce real yeah. critical issue because there's a big gap we're starting to see between People who maybe make too much money for Section 8 or public housing or tax credits, but they don't make near enough to live in a loft. They can't pay twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 a month. But yet they work downtown. They work, you know, they might be a bartender. They might work at the Marriott. They might be a, a waitress and a, a, and, a, and a dozen of other things. But yet they can't afford to live there. So now they've got to get transportation in a lot of cases from wherever they live on the outskirts to downtown. And that be can become a challenge. So why not have good workforce housing downtown? Um, and so that's one thing that the, the Housing Authority is really investigating right now is, is this whole challenge. And it's, and it's not only a challenge, but it's a huge opportunity of building uh, uh, workforce housing. Well, we know that I'm a baby boomer. Yeah. So we're the largest population. We're right. the 62 and over now, and some of us share 74, sure. 75 sure. Approach, approaches that. So that's a big segment of people that you're saying that are in need of subsidized right. housing that's after right. they have retired. That's right. So their income is very sure. not going to go up. So they no, they're it. fixed. So they need those houses sure. for, for the rest of their lives. Sure. So sure. to speak. Sure. So that's a challenge. That is a challenge. Now, the other challenge is we know that. 
you do a great job at managing our public house. Thank you, thank you. We I try. Think we, we I think, try. But I've, I've been all of we have some very we good do. public yeah, house. We do, we do. That's the that's the that's the plus. Right. The minus is right. they're obsolete. They are very obsolete. Absolutely. Powden Home, Simmons yep. Home, Davis, Davis. Yep. Yep. They're obsolete. They are. And most cities are not building any more public housing. The federal government that's went correct. away from public housing. That's correct. That's when correct. are we going to move away? I, but looking at this law, Melissa is right. Right, right, right. Twenty-seven percent. Right. Four thousand on the list. Yeah. We don't know how many people waiting right. to get on the list. Yeah. So the last thing we want to do is take take a public housing right. off the right off, off the market right. while that's going on. Sure. But how do we get beyond this? That's a good question. So, about five years ago, HUD came up with a program called RAD, R-A-D, Rental Assistance Demonstration. So it's a national demonstration. And basically what it allows housing authorities to do is to go from the public housing model, like we talked about, where we own and manage it and keep it up based on the money we're given, to a model where we enter, we enter into a contract with HUD, like the Dempsey, and the rents go up or the subsidy goes up, which allows the housing authority to do more capital improvements into the existing property. So, for, And so, for instance, at Davis, Murphy, and Mounts, and our scattered sites, we're working on that right now. So if we can pull it off, then what will happen is we'll be able to bring in a private investor, a big bank, a, a, a Wells Fargo perhaps, or a RBC, and there's lots of them who do it. They'll give us money, and in return, they can get a tax write-off on their corporate taxes. We can use that money to convert those units. So, for instance, at Davis Homes, what we could do, if this works, is go into those units and totally rehab them, bring them up to date, modernize them, Maybe do some work on the outside, you know, because they all look the same. You know, if you're flying over in an airplane at 30,000 feet, you can pick out Davis Homes, just like you used to be able to pick out Tyndall. Yeah. And it's because that's how they build them back then. So, but you're right, over the years they've become obsolete. So, um, that's a model that we have done and we we're going to continue to do. And that's, unfortunately, that's the only model right now. But you're right. HUD is pretty much getting out slowly, getting slowly out of the public housing business. And you hit on something very key. They are obsolete. So nationwide, they're, the units that were built in the 30s and 40s and 50s, they are functionally obsolete. You know, they were small to begin with. That's how we build them back yeah. then. They were small. A lot of times they didn't have air conditioning. You know, you know all the problems that, that we had. And so we don't, thankfully, we don't build them that way anymore. However, we still got to deal with the existing stock in the United States as well as in Mason. And, and thank you. We do try to manage what we have very, very carefully, very tightly, and, and try to be very judicious and careful with the, the money we get. But you hit it right on the head. Congress, through the years in, in, in public housing, have not they have not allocated the money that's needed. And the older a property gets, the more expensive it becomes to maintain. So go back to those old the, the project based properties that we were talking about in Macon. A lot of those were built in the seventies. So. For instance, Vineville, Christian, even uh, uh, Clisby, and several others were built in the early 70s. Well, that was a long time ago. And so, and they were built small. You know, the market was different back then. And so now you've got a piece of property that, that's aging. It's not getting any better, and it's not getting any younger. But you still, you've got to maintain it because you want a, a decent place for people to live. And that creates a challenge. And so that's, in my view, where HUD, as well as private investors, need to really step up to the, to the table across the United States and say, hey, what are we going to do about this aging stock right. of, of housing? Tell me about the model at Tender. We talked about Tender. It was a, a site of what, 400? 412. 412 yep. units yep. there. So we applied for a grant to demolish it. Correct. Mm -hmm. Not to come back with a public housing, but right. to demolish, demolish it, it, but right. you uh, come back with some senior citizens. Sure. Sure. Houses. And that's right. are there some market rate There's houses some, yep. involved in there as well? Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. So at Tyndall, you're right, there are 412 conventional public housing units. We applied for a, a permission to demolish that public housing. And that's no, feat, that's no easy feat, you know. <laughs> and, and so basically HUD says, look, if you want to demolish public housing, then you have to have a plan for the people who live there right now. You've got to protect them. And, and, and for good reason. So in our case, we got permission to demolish it, and then we gave those who wanted one a voucher. So we gave those people a Section 8 voucher. They could go out into the community. Most of them stayed in Bibb County. Some went to Texas. Some went to California. And But with the right to return. So they had first rights to return, and some people have. So in the senior deal we did, I can't remember. We've had at least 10, if not more, people who were senior who moved 
took that voucher and moved right back into the, the brand new Tindall Seniors. The other part of the property is going to be uh, what we call multifamily. So that means there's no age restriction. It'll be family members. Um, and so, as well, those people who have that voucher from all those years ago at Tyndall, they still have that voucher. They can come back and see if they qualify. And some of them have already applied, and some of them have actually moved into the first phase. So it was 412. We tore it down. We gave vouchers to protect everybody. Those who want to come back can. If they don't, that's okay, too. And some of the people who lived there at the time actually transferred to other public housing units as well, and that was okay, too. So when, we're, when it's all said and done, we, we were, we're going to replace 412 units with 275 units. And so it's going to be less dense, brand new, a lot more modern, and, and it's going to be just terrific. And here's why we did it that way. If you go back in history, Mayor, I'm, I know you'll remember these, the old Prude Igos, the Cabrini Greens of Chicago, the Techwood Homes of Atlanta, and the Tyndall Heights of Macon. We would take, the, the housing industry would take re, a relative sm, relatively small piece of land and just build tons of units. Well, I don't care who you rent to. I don't care what demographic. Anytime you put a lot of people in a small place, that's going to be a challenge. And so over the decades, if you couple that with a, a lack of funding and poor management, you got problems. And so we don't do it that way anymore, thankfully. Yeah. And so Tinder, we came back with, it, we, we spread it out, made it more modern, and, and, we're, and the feedback we're getting from people who are moving in there is just wonderful. I've heard, wonderful. I've heard. Now, you have, you have taken this to another level now. I've read recently where you have some property on Northside Drive, try to get it rezoned. Yes, yes. You want to do some, tell, tell us what's going on yeah, like two minutes. Tell us what's happening. That's exciting. That's exciting. So, so that's the tax credit program. The tax credit program is very, very competitive. We're glad you're moving them out of there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we, we like to rehab what's, you know, in place, but we also like to go to different areas. And so you, a good example is we, we have a piece of land up on the north side, which if you're standing at Ortho, Georgia, and you're standing in the front door and you look to your to your uh, left, you'll go on out back yeah. towards Riverside. So we have a piece of land right there. So we have applied to DCA, the state, for a tax credit on that piece of land. And if we get funded, then we'll build, I believe it's 75 to 80 units of senior housing there, affordable. And what a great location. Yeah, the supermarket. The supermarket, grocery, Riverside. Drugstores, everything you need Absolutely. And, so, and we want to do that as much as we possibly can. You know, we did yeah. the hunt school. So you're not building in a food desert, if you will. Correct. And that's, a, that's, and that's, so a whole not, not, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other issue. Yeah, food deserts are very challenging. Mike, we have run out of time. But tell people, those people who are on that, maybe some of them will be watching. They're on sure, this sure, waiting list. Sure. And they've been on what can they expect? How long can they expect to be on the so, eight list now? That's a very good question. So, th th thankfully, this is a, in, in 2020, we will open it again, and we'll put notices out. We'll put a notice in the newspaper, and we'll we'll put notice. We have good channels, so everybody will know it's open. We'll open it for about five days. There'll be a toll-free number you call, and we have people writing down names, and we take as many as we possibly can. But let's just get it on the list. How long once they get on so the list? So once they get on, normally on there right, before so they yeah. can get a house. And that's not, that's not the so good news because once they get on the list, it, it could be three to five years. Not have to wait. <laughs> yeah, which is too long. The good news is. we got to end poverty in we, this we, we, we got <laughs> to. We, we got to. And we got to build more affordable because housing. Because demand is so great. So we've got to do something to cut down on right. demand we because do. the supply is not keeping up with that's the demand. That's right. That's exactly right. So Mike. You have go ahead. Finish. So go I was ahead. just say so. There's hope. You know, keep 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 hope alive. Get on that list. If you don't get on the list, there's there's those other properties that are Section Eight based. Not under all the best in the world, but they're not terrible, and 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 they're affordable, and there's some really nice ones. So we yeah. and we keep that list of the housing authority. So come see us, and we'll try to point you in the right direction. Oh, we great. can help you. We've been speaking with Mike Austin, who is the executive director, chief executive officer, I should say, of the Macon Bib housing authority doing a great job but he has a lot of challenges we need to let our representatives know they need to get more money in this town with 27 percent poverty so that we can build more affordable houses get people out of these slum conditions that they're living in that's my piece thank mike you. thank you so thank much you. for joining thank us thank you very much for having us look forward to coming back please do thanks. and thank you all for joining us till next week i'm your host jack ellis goodbye